Hello, <clears throat> hello everyone, and welcome to today's masterclass, The Healing Power of Psychedelics. My name is Anna Bjorstam. I am the wellness pioneer of Six Senses. This is for me personally a very exciting masterclass. We have a shaman, a scientist, and a soprano. And I'm going to tell you in just a second why this is such a cool trio to discuss this very interesting subject that a lot of people are talking about it. Um, I've had both firsthand and secondhand experience of the benefits of psychedelics and what it can do. And uh, there are a lot of diverse views on psychedelics. And we're gonna find out a bit about the science, the spiritual world, as well as uh, what Tanya Dion can talk about when it comes to singing mind uh, tanya is such and i'll sp start with ladies first so tanya is a world renowned soprano from australia but she's much more than that she's an innovator public speaker um written so many papers and she's also responsible for a fund which is called mind medicine in australia that works with psychedelics in treating depression and other various um, aspects of mind that can be treated with psychedelics. So she's really an authority. And I also think that the singing, the breath and the wellness around psychedelics is such an important part. And it also can be used to enhance the effect of the psychedelics. So I'm really interested to hear more about what Tanya says. Then we have Alberto Vialdo, who is a dear friend. He's a shaman. He's a doctor. He, I studied under Alberto and very, he's close to my heart. He's taught me so much. And he's written several books with, for instance, Professor David Perlmutter on Power Up Your Brain. But he's lived with the indigenous people where plant medicine is something that is sacred and a very important part of their healing process. So he's gonna share his knowledge that spans over both the energetic, the shamanistic and the science field. And then we have Professor David Nutt, who's been, uh, Alberta actually said to, that he was almost star struck by David Nutt because he's been one of the pioneers when it comes to psychedelic research. And at times, I think two, 10 years ago, it was not a popular research method to have. David has also said that the absolute most dangerous drug in the world is alcohol. So we're going to hear a bit about alcohol potentially as well as psychedelics. And uh, he's a true authority in this field. And David is also going to kick off today's session. Now, just before we um, get on to the session and in a couple of minutes, I just want to give you some directions if you have problems of uh, any sort. Usually the best thing is to just sign off and sign in again. If you have questions, we're going to have three presentations. David, Alberto and Tanya are going to present. And at the end, then we're going to have Q&A and discussions among the three. Very interesting. So if you have questions, put it in the Q&A box. That's usually the easiest thing at the bottom. Or you can also put it in the chat. We are monitoring both and we will collect and answer as many questions as we can. And other than that, I would just say sit back, enjoy and learn so much from this amazing trio. So Professor David Nutt, the scene is yours to talk a little bit about the research and the science behind it. Thank you very much, Anna. It's great to be on the panel with uh, such a distinguished 
other participants. And I'm sure I'm going to learn a great deal from them and hopefully they will learn a bit from me. So here is my talk. Can you all see it now? Yes, I, I hope you can. Yes, just confirm, we are just... Confirm it there. Yeah. Great. Okay, so as uh, you heard from Anna's introduction, I'm a, a researcher. I'm actually a psychiatrist and um, also a sort of neuroscientist. And about 15 years ago, I started researching psychedelics, largely because I'd researched every other kind of brain active drug. And these were the ones that were crying out to be studied. And that research has led on to in, in fascinating insights, which are very relevant to their therapeutic um, value, both in terms of, um, of well-being, but also in terms of more classical uh, psychiatric remedies. So for those of you, I guess most of you are aware, but when we're talking about psychedelics, we're talking about a range of different compounds, such as uh, you've got peyote, mescaline here, some form of magic mushrooms here. You've got ayahuasca, which is this cocktail of uh, two separate agents, DMT, which comes from one of the plants, and uh, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor called harmaline, which comes from the other plant. And the combination allows DMT to be active when you drink it, because without the harmaline, DMT is broken down in the gut and the liver, so it doesn't get into the brain. So this is a, a remarkable discovery made, I think, probably many thousands of years ago by indigenous peoples in the um, Amazon basin, which is, a, which is why they're so much further down the path of understanding DMT than we are in the West, because they have ac had access to it in this drinkable form. This mushroom here is Amanita muscaris. This is a sort of Northern European, Siberian, um, psychedelic it's very different from the others it works on the GABA system these all work on the serotonin system but again it's been around for a very long time and this is I just love this uh, Roman mosaic showing them the brewing up of the um, Amanita tea so this is the sort of west equivalent of the ayahuasca uh, sorry the east equivalent of ayahuasca in the west and that goes by a thousand years morning glory the seeds of which contain ergot as does ergot, this fungus. And the most, I think the most important image here is this image here of, this is an ancient Greek vase, it's 3000 years old, and it shows a Greek noble person partaking of ergot, which they thought was a part of the rye, which we now know, of course, was a fungus growing on the rye. Uh, and as part of their mysteries, the Eleusinian mysteries were driven by the use of this psychedelic fungus. And uh, it's perfectly, reasonable to say, I think credible, that a great deal of what we now have as Western culture has come from Greece, ancient Greece. And I think many of the insights that the Greeks got from their mysteries could be traced back to the use of psychedelics. And uh, so you could argue that psychedelics have underpinned the whole of what we now call Western civilization. But the big change in the way when the West really came to understand psychedelics was with the discovery of LSD by this man, Albert Hoffman. And there's a picture of him, him in his uh, villa overlooking Lake Geneva at 100 years of age. And um, it's been, obviously, the image has been colorized to make it more psychedelic. Hoffman discovered LSD accidentally, realized it was hugely important as a tool for understanding brain function and also as a potential therapeutic tool. And he persuaded his company, Sando, to make it available. And he used it himself, and he lived to over 100, died at 102. The first British psychiatrist to use it lived to 103. So those, very, those pioneers give lie to the fact that these drugs are dangerous to the brain. And in fact, they suggest, and there is some evidence to support this now, that they might actually be um, age or health promoting for the aging brain. And when psychedelic came to, uh, sorry, when LSD came to Western medicine in the 1950s, it was used for four purposes. It was used to model psychosis as a, an experimental tool. It was used by mental health professionals, partic uh, particularly young ones who were given it by their bosses to, to help them get an ex a sense of, of what it's like to have a different kind of mindset, to get some insights into the fact that your mind and brain can be changed so that they would be more sympathetic or empathetic with patients who had uh, 
somewhat similar alterations in consciousness. And then, of course, most famously, it was used in psychotherapy. And it, there were two forms of psychotherapy. The first was called psychedelic psychotherapy, a high dose, a single dose, which is what we're using today in our trials. And that produces quite a powerful trip with quite a, often a mystical or peak experience. And on, often within a single session can help people recover from disorders like depression or addiction. And then there was the uh, other form called psycholytic psychotherapy, where people use lower doses, what we might call a midi dose. So dose that has some psychological effects, but not you don't get a full hallucinatory trip. And those lower doses um, were seen to facilitate people engaging in psychotherapy, help break down some of the resistance that uh, people have to telling the truth or even understanding the truth about their own mental processes. And from 1953 to 1967, there were a vast amount of research was done with LSD and also with less with psilocybin. The National Institutes of Health in America funded 140 grants. There were a thousand clinical papers, 40,000 patients were studied, 40 books, six international conferences. And in 1971, when the UN conventions banned these drugs, Masters and Houston pulled together an oversight of all that research concluding that the results were overwhelmingly positive, describing safe and effective treatments. And here are analyses of four of major reviews of many subjects, 5,000, 25,000 drug sessions, 20 years, 4,000 patients. The bottom line of all these analyses is that treatment with LSD is not without acute adverse reactions, but given adequate psychiatric supervision and proper conditions for its administration, the incidence of such reactions is not great. And these data are really important because they show rates of psychosis lower than the normal population, rates of suicide lower than the normal population for psychiatric patients. The clinical data was, was there. It's in complete contrast to the hysteria that's been promoted subsequently, try to get the drugs banned. And uh, it's the clinical data which we need to rely on today. But the drugs did get banned. In 1971, the UN Conventions on Psychotropic Banned or Psychedelics, pretty much around the world, almost every country signed up to it. And you can see the negative impact it had on research. Up to this point, by 1970, there have been over a thousand papers published on LSD. There's a number of papers per year. And here's psilocybin, and psilocybin was made of medicine in 1958. But with the UN ban, two things happened. The first thing was that the US government stopped funding research and pretty much every other government did the same. And the second is even if you could get funding from charities, for instance, you couldn't get the drug, they effectively banned the drug. And this loss of research knowledge for the last 50 years is the worst censorship of research in the history of the world. It's been outrageous. The banning was, was based on lies. It was done to try to stop the anti-Vietnam War protest. It's per been perpetuated on the argument that it stops people using a dangerous drug. But of course, what it does is deny access of a healing drug to many millions of people. And the cost benefit of the, of the band versus the lost benefit to people is, is absolutely disproportionately against the therapeutic use. Well, we started working with this drug, these drugs recently. We've studied psilocybin, we've studied LSD, and we have studied DMT. We're studying 5-methoxy-DMT now. All these drugs work on the serotonin receptors in the brain, particularly the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor. So here's a human brain, and the hotter the area here, the more of these receptors there are. And the 5-HT2A receptor is a, is a fascinating receptor because the human brain has more of these in any other brain. And the, there are more of these receptors in the parts of the brain which make us human, the recently evolved parts of the brain, than there are in the parts of the brain which we share with other um, animals, you know, certainly going back for um, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of years. The, uh, the 5 ht 2 a receptor is the receptor which some people believe has been responsible for the, the vast growth of the human brain in recent evolutionary time. 
So about 10 years ago now, we did the first modern imaging study with psilocybin. We gave it to normal healthy volunteers and we were surprised. In fact, we were astounded to discover that it didn't turn on the brain. It actually just turned off. When you see an image like this, blue, these fMRI images, blue is less activity. And we found that psilocybin reduced activity in the, the parts of the brain called the cingulate cortex, which is where you integrate emotions with memories and with plans, etc. And one particular part of this cortex is this little part here, which is called the subgenual. And what was fascinating about this discovery was that we knew from previous imaging work that a whole range of different treatments for depression dampened down activity in that brain region. And they range from SSRIs to CBT to sleep deprivation, et cetera. Even placebo, if you get better on placebo, activity in that brain region is attenuated. And that tells us that that part of the brain is quite a critical node in driving depression. It's overactive in depression. It seems to drive the negative thinking, the ruminations of depression. And to get over depression, you have to dampen it down. So that was one pointer to using these drugs in depression. The next was a discovery that psychedelics break down what's called the default mode network in the brain. Now, the default mode network is so-called because it's the network of the brain which is active when everything else is shut off. So, and those of you who've been to the six senses spas and we're going into, air, into for instance, meditation, you will know this. When you've got eye shades on, when you're not hearing anything, if you're in a silent contemplation, you're not moving, you're relaxing, you're just thinking, then the part of the brain that does that thinking is the default mode. And it's a part of the brain which is in the front of the brain here and the back of the brain here. And this is where your sense of self is encoded. Uh, this is where your ego, if you're a Freudian, is encoded. And if you're a spiritual person, this is where your spirit is encoded. And what was remarkable was that psychedelics completely disrupt the default mode network. Here you see it, these four regions linked together, working together, here you don't see it. And uh, is that disruption of the default mode which produces the experience of uh, your sense of being out of body, out of place. Uh, often people would say that they're, you know, as if their body moved into space, they went into another dimension, etc. Because these, this network is really what encodes your sense of where you are and who you are. Now, what's that got to do with depression? Well, the default mode network is overconnected in depression. The people with depression have more of their brain engaged in this self-referential thinking about themselves. Uh, and that is driven by this area, the subgenual cingulate, which forces this activity onto the brain. And down here, you see that people with depression, the greater their rumination scores, the greater the connectivity of the default mode. And that makes perfect sense because the default mode is thinking about yourself and rumination is thinking about yourself. So we thought, well, if we can disrupt the default mode and it's overactive in depression, maybe we can treat depression. And so we did a study. And these are the data, the 20, first 20 subjects published a few years ago now. And what you, these are all people with resistant depression. They'd all failed on at least two drugs. They'd all failed on CBT and they were moderately depressed here and their depression scores halved within a week. In fact, they halved within a day. And these recoveries, the means here stayed very significant. Even at six months when some were relapsing, you still see overall there was significant benefit statistically. And some people are still well, eight years on, they're still well. Not many, only about 20%. For the rest, the depression times come, starts to creep back. But the fact we could with a single treatment, a single 25 milligram dose of psilocybin produced for some people the longest remission they'd ever had in their depression. It's remarkable. And in fact, it's the most powerful single treatment, single dose treatment of resistant depression there's ever been. And that's led to, to a number of pharmaceutical companies being set up to develop psilocybin as a medicine. How does it work in depression. Well, I've shown you it disrupts depressive thinking, but it does more than that. 
it also opens up the mind to other ways of thinking about life, stress, the past, etc. And this is a very, um, it's almost a meme for our research. This is an image produced by a mathematics group in King's College London. And each of those images has exactly the same number of connections. But on the left side here, which is the placebo side, normal condition, most of the connections in the brain are around the edge. This is called the small world brain. Mostly the parts of the brain which do the same thing talk to each other. So the visual cortex talks to the self auditory cortex to itself. Of course, there's got to be some crosstalk because if you see a tiger, you've got to start your legs moving and running. But the brain is an extremely efficient computer. It's 10 times more efficient than any known computer in terms of energy used. And it achieves that efficiency by not wasting time doing a lot of cross brain communication. That could be a problem because you can get locked into thinking. Depressive thinking is a state where you actually overthink. You, get, you don't have cognitive stability. You're locked into behavior. You can't do. But under psychedelics, you see there's an enormous amount of increased connectivity across the brain. Area in which haven't talked to each other since you were a baby can now talk to each other. And this is a child's brain. Everything is possible. And over time, education forces it into this much more constrained way of working, which is very efficient. It's useful for doing maths and, and speaking a, a foreign language or your own language, et cetera, finding your way around. But it's fixed. And the second fix, it becomes much more plastic. And this is why people can come up with new solutions to old problems under psychedelics. They can see what was wrong and they can also see alternatives. So they don't need to be continually feeling that they're worthless just because I told them they were. They can listen to other people's voices, etc. So this increased flexibility, which occurs in the psychedelic state, I think is one important reason why people do see other ways of dealing with life. And it changes attitude. In, in our first study, we asked people, we gave people a questionnaire, look at whether they were optimistic or pessimistic. And depressed people score negatively on they score on pessimism. They call it pessimism bias. Depressed people feel that the world is a nasty, hostile, unpleasant place. In fact, they're right. It is. But knowing that doesn't help you. Knowing that just makes it worse in a way. Most of us have what's called an optimism bias. And after psychedelic treats like psilocybin treatment, the depressed people lost their pessimism bias. They became like the rest of us. They essentially are more positive about the world. And here's a description from one of our patients. My outlook has changed significantly. I'm more aware now it's pointless to get wrapped up in endless negativity. I feel as if I've seen a picture. And I want to just point out this, this journal here. I'm a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist. I'd never heard of the Journal of Humanistic Psychology till we started trying to find somewhere to publish these patient narratives. I never ever imagined I'd publish in a journal like that. And in fact, this is one of the best papers I've ever been party to because it, this, the stories of these patients, how they overcome their depression, which is, which is detailed in here, it's really extremely impressive. I'll just give you one more example. A lot of our patients use quotes um, which rely on computer analogies. Uh, to explain the difference. And, and here you've got, you've got this now, you see. It was like when you defragged the hard drive on your computer. I experienced blocks going into place, things being rearranged in my mind. I visualized as it was all put in order, a beautiful experience with those gold blocks going into black drawers that would illuminate. And I thought, my brain is being defragged. How brilliant is that? My mind works differently now. I ruminate much less, and so my thoughts feel ordered, contextualized. Rumination was like thoughts out of context, out of time. Now my thoughts feel like they make sense with context and logical flow. I mean, what a beautiful description of how the brain is being reset, the mind is being reset by a psychedelic. I want to finish just by mentioning the study that came out just a couple of weeks ago, where we then took on our first study, and we did a comparison between psilocybin and the SSRI, s uh, and uh, this is published in the, the leading medical journal, New England of Medicine. 
which is a remarkable, the first psychedelic study ever published in this journal. And what it shows is what you, I think, now would predict that psilocybin over here has a, a very rapid improvement in, in depression scores, which get increased after the second dose. The first dose was here, the second dose was here. And escitalopram does quite well, but it doesn't do as well. And it's always less good than um, psilocybin. On depression scores, when you look at wellness, here you see psilocybin does very, very well. Wellness improves dramatically after the first dose of psilocybin and carries on creeping up after the second dose. So an escitalopram works much more slowly. And this tells us there's fundamental differences in the mode of action of these drugs. These are two completely separate ways of lifting depression. And if you want to read more about it, there's a little review we wrote last year, which takes you right from the, the neuron and the receptor to the, to the brain, uh, to the EEG, and then into brain integration. So if those of you who've got scientific inclinations, feel free to read this relatively straightforward account. And I will stop now and uh, hand over to, I think, Tanya speaking next. I believe it was actually Alberta, but thank you so much, uh, David. That is incredibly interesting and so much research. And I know that 10 years ago, you were out in the wind and criticized for charging forward with psilocybin. And now it's so good to see that you're the hero again and, and leading this charge forward. So it's, it's sure, truly interesting. So I believe Alberto, I think you are up next. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, David. What a beautiful presentation, exquisite research. It's so great to see that these amazing medicines are coming back into the laboratory and from up into the into the research centers and eventually, hopefully shortly, into the hands of people that really need this kind of help. So I'm a medical anthropologist by training, and I've spent many years in the Amazon and in the Andes working with the shamans, with the indigenous healers. But before that, I was on the faculty at San Francisco State University and um, directing a very small neuroscience lab. We were trying to see if the brain could create psychosomatic health. We knew we could create psychosomatic disease, but could we create of health with the brain? And, and um, that led me to the Amazon. One day I discovered I was looking out of the wrong end of the microscope and that I needed to go to uh, societies, to cultures that did not have MRIs, that did not have technology, that all they had was the power of the mind, of the brain to create health with the aid of many of these sacred medicines. And there's where I discovered the, the importance of the sacred of ceremony, not only the chemical action that we are so familiar with in the West, where we have a, a medicine that's based on one pill, one ill, but rather how do how does what is the power of the context of the ceremony in which this occurs? And um, and David wanted one of my first research papers was actually published in the Journal for Humanistic Psychology as well on psychedelic psychotherapy that was being done in Mexico. And um, the, the interesting question for me, as I worked with the shamans who are in reality, humanity's first neuroscientist, they discovered the extraordinary ability of the mind to research consciousness. So whereas in the West, we use the mind to investigate the cosmos, gravity and the quantum field and biology the shamans and many of the practitioners in the East and Tibet use the mind to study the mind and to study consciousness itself and with the aid of these extraordinary plants. But the question for me at the beginning was why do we have receptor sites in the brain for these psychedelics? Why, why is there a receptor site for LSD? Why is there a receptor site for for psilocybin, why is DMT, which is a, and then when you study the chemistry of these, of these substances, you find that DMT is basically a, a methylated serotonin. It's a, it's a neurotransmitter. 
that's had a methyl ring, methyl bond attached to it. Why did the, the great spirit create a brain that had all these extraordinary receptor sites and what role did they play in the history of human evolution? For example, 50,000 years ago, humanity took a gigantic quantum leap in technology. Technologies that hadn't changed in a million years, suddenly in the space of a couple of generations, take a gigantic quantum leap, hunting technologies. We discover how to use hooks, how to sew uh, garments together. We uh, discover art and the exquisite paintings and the cave paintings in Lascaux and Altamira 50,000 years ago. What part did, did these psychedelics, these mind manifesting, that's what the word means, um, sacred plants, play in this gigantic leap and evolution. And the more that I studied with indigenous people, the more that I became convinced that the human evolution and discovery, particularly the process of discovery, was very closely tied to the work with the sacred medicines, but they had to be used in a sacred context within ceremony. So it, we know enough about the brain, about especially the ancient brain, the, the mammalian or limbic brain, which is the Neanderthal, what I call the Neanderthal brain, because it's so ancient that this brain needs ceremony in order to change. And that's why we have ceremonies in every culture around the world. We have wedding ceremonies and rites of passage and death rituals and birth ceremonies and, and, um, so this brain seems to need ceremony in order to change. And this is that ancient brain of the emotions where you have the stress response, the fight or flight system, that HPA axis, this, this region in the brain that says, hey, there's danger out there, we gotta fight or flee, or we can, if the signal gets sent to the upper brain, this can be an opportunity. So many creative peoples are able to see opportunity where everybody else is only seeing danger because they're not getting triggered into this fight or flight. Now, what I learned with the shamans is that in order to heal, whether it be depression, anxiety, or physical ailments, you needed to reset the fight or flight system. You could not be living in fear with a bunch of stress molecules, adrenaline and cortisol in your brain and hope to trigger the body's self-healing mechanism mechanisms to create psychosomatic health. So what the shamans in the Amazon did is that they first began by repairing, resetting the fight or flight system in this ancient limbic brain through ceremony, through sacred ceremony. And the problem with the fight or flight system is that it's not a normal, the ordinary system in the body, which is a feedback system. You get feedback and you reset, you adjust, you adapt. You stop eating and digestive juices stop being secreted in your stomach. The fight or flight system is a feed forward system. So it's not feedback regulated, it's feed forward. The more adrenaline, the more cortisol you produce, the more that this region in the brain associated with learning, the hippocampus gets damaged, which is rich in cortisol receptor. And then the more adrenaline and the more cortisol that's triggered into production. We go into this highly caffeinated lifestyle where we cannot rest, where we can we sleep, but we don't rest. We have sleep disorders happening and the, um, and the whole brain chemistry gets thrown out. We develop psychosomatic disease, which has a brain chemistry associated with it. So the first thing that they did was to work on resetting the fight or flight to create safety. And then once the person was able to experience safety, and just a quick parenthesis, for many of us, our fight or flight system was triggered when we were inside our mother's womb. Because the stress hormones, the adrenaline and cortisol go right through the placental barrier. And, and that if your mother did not feel that she could count on her husband or on the world to support her and her baby or to be there for her, you, you were born with your fight or flight triggered. You were born into a world that was not safe. 
and that was scary. And today, many of us are born into a world that is scary. Even today as an adult, I look at the world and it looks like a pretty scary place at times. But he said team fight or flight was really, really essential. And it's interesting because the, as, as David was pointing out, these plants work on the same serotonin system that, um, that repair the hippocampus, which is what the SSRIs do, these, these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We can repair this region in the brain. They reset fight or flight. You're able to enter into a place of quiet where your world begins to change. Now, the shamans, of course, did this through not just the plant chemistry, but through their energetic and sacred interventions, their, their healing strategies that had to do with working with the human energy field. So the, um, in my work with indigenous peoples, I, I came to understand that the power of ceremony and how the most important healing experience that you could have was an experience of the sacred. Uh, with the ayahuasca, the ayahuasca, the, uh, the the brain chemistry is fascinating because it's a it's serotonin that's methylated, um, but it needs to have an MAO inhibitor so it doesn't get destroyed in your gut, so it can get through the gut and into the brain. And how many of our foods from the ferment the the, the aged cheeses, for example, are all MAO inhibitors that allow serotonin to go through the gut wall and into the brain and and repair the brain. And interestingly, our serotonin, 85, 90% of it is produced by your flora in your gut. And today with our overuse of antibiotics, our gut flora has been decimated. So we're not getting the, the serotonin that um, is that the brain needs in order to heal and to repair. So I'm convinced that today in the West, we have an epidemic of broken brains, of brains that have been broken, of brains that are not getting the, the, the necessary nutrients to be able to repair and to regenerate. So when I went to um, college years ago, we used to think that the brain could not regenerate. That in fact, that every shot of tequila that you had was 25,000 neurons, you were never getting back again. But today we've discovered that the brain can repair itself, that the brain produces actually stem cells that will regenerate the brain, that there are certain foods that facilitate the production of, brain, of these brain stem cells, like the um, like the omega 3s, DHA, that trigger the production of neurotropic factors that regenerate neurons. Amazing, we can repair and regenerate the brain. From, for the shamans that I worked with, this was a fascinating understanding that they had a long time ago because they knew how to do this without being able to explain it, without being able to explain the pathways and being able to understand the neurochemistry. They had an instinctual understanding their science was not explicatory it was not information driven like ours is but it was driven was guided by the ability to implement change so so for for us for example we live in a time and in a in a predominantly masculine science that explains things that tells us that water is h2o but the the shaman said, well, the important thing is, are you able to make it rain? We have a very diagnostic medicine, 150,000 different diagnoses. But for the shamans, the important thing is, are you able to heal? So it's how do you do it? How do you bring this about? And the sacred medicines were essential, were extraordinarily important in that, not only in dealing with psychiatric disorders and Remember, in the West, we have, we practice medicine by geography. So we have the psychiatrist, and we have the neurologist, and the GI doctors, and the podiatrist, and the gastroenterologist, and they don't talk to each other, basically. But when you're working with a system, which is what the human mind-body system is, 
you find that the state of your mind is related to the state of your gut, is related to how you love and how you forgive. And what I discovered when I first started working with these shamanic practitioners is that they dealt with the entire system, including your connection to the ecosystem, to nature. And they didn't have 150,000 illnesses like we have in, our, in the West, they had only one. They said, look, illnesses do not exist. Sick people exist, but illnesses do not really exist. And the only illness is this connection from nature, from the feminine, from the divine mother, from, the, from Gaia, from, from the mother. And I remember one of my early ayahuasca sessions in the jungle and the, um, um, the shaman came to me and he said, we have to exercise the death that lives within you. And um, I go, please, yes. <laughs> and, um, and in this session, he started sucking out the poison that was in my soul and in my energy field. And I became lighter and lighter. And suddenly I could speak with Gaia. I heard the voice of the mother. And anything that I asked her, she would respond. This was the voice of the plant. It seems that we lost uh, Alberta. So let's see. He's Alberta's right now in Chile. Uh, one never knows about the, um, the IT and the connectivity. So I think that he looks awfully frozen right now. So we'll just see. And Alberta, you are back, I can see. So brilliant. So I will let you. We just lost you for a second. So as you were talking about how you started speaking with Mother Earth or Gaia or Pachamama, so over to you again. But you are muted. The most common phrase last year. I am in a mountaintop in South America. I apologize, we, our internet collapses occasionally. So, in, uh, so one of my first ayahuasca sessions the shaman I was working with in the upper Amazon, right at the edge of the Amazon River, was saying to me, we need to ec exercise the death that lives within you. And I said, yes, please. And, and he began to do these sucking extractions and working with my luminous energy field to, to heal me from all the lifelessness within my psyche, everything that had died, all of the lost hopes and the lost dreams and the broken loves and and as this happened, I found that I could speak with the plant, that I could speak with the ayahuasca. As the shaman said, I was speaking with the ayahuasca. And I asked her, is it, are you the plant that I'm speaking with? And she said, no, I am the mother. I am Gaia. I am the earth. And it was this experience of recovering this dialogue with nature where I could speak with, many of you have had this experience where you could speak to Gaia, to the mother, and you could hear her response. And this was considered an essential element of any healing process, <clears throat> whether it be depression or anxiety or physical illness, you had to reestablish that connection with the sacred. So you could speak directly to spirit. Now, this is what we were able to do when we were still walking in the Garden of Eden, where we still lived in paradise. What our mythology tells us is that before we were cast out of the garden, we could speak with God, with spirit, with the mountains, with the rivers and the trees. And here I was at the edge of the Amazon, again, speaking with the rivers and the trees and the mountains and with spirit. And spirit was speaking back to me. And I thought of this interesting encounter that the, um, that the Inca ruler had with the conquistadors. The very first meeting between the Spanish conquistadors and the Inca, the conquistadors brought the priest with them. And the priest handed the uh, Inca a Bible and said, this is the word of God. 
And the Inca took the book and put it to his ear and he listened and he threw it on the ground and he said, what kind of God is this that does not speak? What kind of mute God is this? When did your God last talk to you? And the priest said, uh, 1500 years ago. And he asked the Inca, when did your God last speak with you? And the Inca said, this morning at breakfast. So here I was speaking with spirit, again, recovering the sacred dialogue with all of nature. And this is considered a milestone. You have to cross that milestone to achieve deep systemic healing, not just removal of symptoms, not only the, the, the palliatory, but deep transformation that had to happen that included a process of death and rebirth. And this is where the ayahuasca gets its name because the name means the ayahuasca. Aya means death, the vine of death, the vine of the dead, the vine that takes you through the process of death and transmutation and resurrection and return. And that becomes a key process of every healing. There has to be a death death has to be exercised from us like that medicine man said so what i I'm, I'm so encouraged that after this science of the psychedelics being silenced so dramatically like david was pointing out in the last 50 years that we're again embarking opening up ourselves to work with these sacred plants that have been part of every culture the present in every culture and every society around the world. And the, um, I'm so excited that we're getting to work with the sacred medicines, and, which is happening at a time, a historical moment, in which in the West we're shedding this dysfunctional, masculine, reductionistic paradigm. And that has brought us to the edge of extinction and to abusing nature in the way that we have been. And we're re Marking on, on this reconnection with the feminine. I remember years ago thinking in the United States where I lived for half of the year, thinking how can we live in a society that allows someone to go to a bar and to drink a bunch of alcohol and that's legal. And then you drive home in 150 miles an hour and you wanna get into fights, but it's illegal to smoke marijuana. And when you smoke marijuana, you don't want to get into fights. You want to hug people. And you don't drive home at 150 miles an hour. You drive home at 10 miles an hour. And you go, wow, did you see that tree? It's incredible. But that was illegal. These heightened states of consciousness have been part of every society in history that allowed the individual freedom of discovery. And these systems that are so repressive today, that are, the, that are so founded on a reductionistic and, and very bigoted uh, set of values are breaking down. And today we're rediscovering these ancient tools and we're using it not only to therapeutically with our sickest people, with the people that are hurting and suffering the most, but we're using it creatively. Microdosing is rampant everywhere. People are microdosing. They're they're turning their brains on to to find direction and meaning in their lives and to participate in discovery in the kind of discovery of technologies that will help us resolve the crisis we're living in. The energy crisis, the 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 systemic breakdown of ecosystems. The, that this medicine has returned not only to the lab but to the hands of, of many many individuals so as a medical anthropologist i had the chance to to try many of these substances from the morning glories which are the natural lsds to the the, the ayahuasca the san pedro cactus and and one of my most cherished experiences was um with albert hoffman many years ago at a conference and where we were at a very small gathering within the conference and someone offered us all MDMA, ecstasy. And Hoffman says, I do not take anything stronger than LSD. But having an evening with him of ceremony, 
And, um, and Hoffman actually microdosed uh, 10 micrograms of LSD till the end of his life at the age of 101. Every Sunday, with 10 micrograms, he would go walking through his garden with, with friends and, uh, and connecting back to the garden, back to nature, back to that garden that we were really truly never kicked out of, that we're still living in, and that uh, we are so dedicated to recovering today, to becoming stewards of of the earth and as the shamans say that our mission is to become earth keepers stewards and earth keepers and once we assume that mission then everything conspires to support us in our journey of healing and of growth so thank you very much i i'm passing it back to you anna i don't know if i've exceeded my time but um... well i think it's such a wonderful teaching that you are uh, giving us and i think it's interesting where we hear uh, dave talking about the brain imaging and what areas very scientific but also we shall not forget the connection with our whole body but also our the earth and understand the ecosystem so i think when you do take ayahuasca psilocybin and the likes is that you do get an understanding of how you fit in to everything and how you are not just someone that can use and abuse the resources we have on earth but we're also part of this ecosystem and uh, you just become a bit more of a loving person as you say so i think that is an incredible important aspect of the use of psychedelics and that gives me a perfect segue to go over to tanya so thank you so much for your wisdom alberto and the stories that you've shared We'll come back to you very shortly. So Tanya, uh, really warm welcome on stage and just tell us about from your perspective, which is a, a very different one from each one of. And of course, I just want to say, if you have any questions, uh, do put them into the Q&A or in the comment sections, and we will try to answer them as soon as possible. So take it away, Tanya. Okay, thank you. And I just want to check you can see my screen also. We can indeed. Oh, good. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, dear David, who is, is one of the ambassadors of Mind Medicine Australia and Alberto, who I've been a, a long time admirer of. I think I've bought all your books, multiple copies for many, many friends. So it's fascinating hearing you talk about these medicines um, and uh, look forward to many more conversations about that. So, uh, I come from um, a background uh, as, as a performer and um, there was a time when we all used to sing. We sat around campfires at churches, at schools, and we sang our stories and our dreams and we sang alone and we sang together. And so starts my TED talk, how singing together changes the brain. We also used to share sacred medicines together as, as Alberto and David have both mentioned right since the beginning of human civilization. The wonderful thing about the neuroscience of singing is that singing makes us healthier, happier, more creative, and particularly when we sing with others. It also improves our memory, language, and concentration. It is like a super wonder drug, and it has always been my super wonder drug until five years ago when I had my first therapeutic dose of psilocybin, and um, I found that psilocybin was even more powerful as a medicine than singing. But both, both of them are extremely important for us as human beings in terms of our development and in terms of our connection to self, others and planet. One of the really other really important things with singing and particularly with singing with others is that singing really connects you to the right side of your brain. And unfortunately, we spend a lot of time, especially nowadays, in the left side of our brain being very uh, overwhelmed by facts and figures and, and logic and rationale. Said that we spend about 85% of our time in the left side of our brain. Of course, that side of our brain can be automated. We also spend so much time there that we're becoming more and more drained, burnt out. And that has been leading to this epidemic of loneliness and social isolation and depression because we're not spending enough time in the right side of our brain, our creative, intuitive, imaginative, human battery charger. 
which our right side of our brain is. And we need to spend more time there. We need to spend more time there because it's more healthy. We're more connected to others and ourselves and the planet. We're connected to everything and everyone that is when we're in the right side of our brain. But also importantly, the right side of our brain is something that's not so easy to automate, can't be replaced by machines and artificial intelligence. So we need to get into that right side of our brain more often and singing does that, dancing of course, and, and tribes have sung and danced since the beginning of human civilization as well. Yet there is a taboo often about singing uh, in public or even speaking in public. And of course, meditation and many other forms of uh, self-healing, walking in nature, hugging our loved ones, uh, our pets and so on also help to take us more into a right side of our brain into the right hemisphere of our brain and Albert Einstein famously said you know the intuitive mind is the gift and the rational mind is the faithful servant we've created a society that has um, I, now I've just lost my um, place on my screen just one moment sorry that has um, focused on the servant and has forgotten the gift and we're also now in this world where everything is moving so fast. There's a saying that says, you know, things are getting faster and faster. We're moving more and more quickly and we simply cannot keep up with the pace of change. And in that environment, it becomes even more important for us to have a raised collective consciousness, to raise our collective intelligence, as Alberto talked about, to really celebrate and welcome in these heightened states of consciousness that lead to a, a sense of freedom for every human being. And yet many of us have never felt more constrained or more repressed. Yuval Noah Harari says the most important thing for the future is to invest in our emotional intelligence and to build a more flexible personality because the greatest challenges will be psychological. And so, it's in that context that um, I've always been a, a seeker and um, my husband and I came across an article by Michael Pollan back in 2016 called The Trip Treatment. It was in the New Yorker magazine. And I read this article, which was about psychedelic assisted therapies, particularly for end of life treatments. And there was a article, an interview with this, man who was in the trial in the New York University trial and they achieved 80% remission rates for patients who had an end of life terminal cancer diagnosis. And 80% of those people went into remission from their anxiety and depression accompanying that end of life diagnosis. And one of them was this guy who was a Holocaust survivor and I'm the daughter and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. And um, so this article really spoke to me and I become more aware that you know, we're all carrying this collective trauma. Even if we haven't directly experienced trauma in our own life, serious trauma, we, we all have different kinds of trauma, but we're all carrying trauma that has been with us since the Garden of Eden. And so it's really interesting to think about ways that we can actually let go of that enormous weight that we're carrying along with us, so much baggage that we're carrying. And if we could let that go, what might that release and what sort of healing could occur on this planet? And so I was compelled um, to go with my husband to see if we could get into some of the trials in the UK. Actually, we, we contacted Dave, Robin Carhart Harris um, initially, who's a colleague of David's and, um, and see if we could get in one of his trials, but there weren't any healthy patients trials going on. So we finally found a therapist in the Netherlands. We went to the Netherlands and we had a significant dose of psilocybin in combination with some Syrian rue, which is an MAOI inhibitor, which um, Alberto and, and David have spoken about. And this really blasted us into the stratosphere and um, we had a complete ego dissolution. Uh, I was able to throw my, my ego in the bin. I had three red crosses in the ceremony uh, with a big drain underneath. And the red crosses were over three words saying ego, ego, ego across the page. And um, 
I just kept saying, go down the drain, go down the drain, ego, and pushing my ego down the drain until finally, when I had succeeded in doing that, I was able to travel with this incredible medicine and to really come to terms and accept some of the trauma that had occurred in my life and my ancestors' lives, and also to find new connections and new ways of being in the world, find a new sense of acceptance, more flexibility, and so on, which these medicines are renowned for. And this was important because then my husband and I actually um, came back to Australia and both of us had set up um, some charities and this is our fifth charity that we set up, Mind Medicine Australia. And we realised that at the heart of any kind of disadvantage um, in all the charities that we were had founded, that um, the biggest problem that everyone was suffering who was experiencing any kind of disadvantage was mental illness. And we started to really do a lot of research in the space of mental health in Australia. And we also connected with all the researchers around the world, which is when we connected with David and a number of others who we now work with, with in Mind Medicine Australia. And we started to learn about these medicines. And we started to learn about what was really happening in terms of mental health treatment as well. And even pre-COVID, this is the statistics that we have in Australia. You know, one in five Australian adults have a, a chronic mental illness. One in eight Australians on antidepressants, including one in four older Australians. One in 30 children on antidepressants, including children as young as four years of age. But since COVID has been around, these numbers have, have become severely exacerbated. So we expect the statistics to be even worse. And it's interesting to contemplate that Australia is actually second worst statistics in mental health in the world, just ahead of Iceland, and yet we have a lot more sunshine. So what could be going on? And um, so what happened was we did some more research and we found that only 30 to 35% of sufferers experienced remission from current existing treatments for depression. And in the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, only as few as 5% of sufferers actually experience remission from existing treatments. So we realise that more of the same is not going to solve the problem, which is, you know, what really led us to set up Mind Medicine Australia as a charity. And my husband and I are both philanthropists and social entrepreneurs. But what we also found was that everyone kept talking about, you know, more telehealth, more patient access gateways. Let's train more psychiatrists, more psychologists you know, maybe that will help to solve the problem. But in actual fact, the problem is that there's just no innovation in the treatments for mental illness. So though these medicines exist and they've been used in ancient civilizations since the beginning of human civilization, in Australia, like many other nations, they've been banned since 1970 when President Nixon had his war on drugs. And so here you have the elephant in the room. And, you know, we need to listen to that elephant because that elephant is saying we need to make sure that these treatments become available so that more people can get well. And as David has talked about, you know, 60 to 80 percent remission rates in the majority of trials that are occurring around the world today. And that is significantly better than the existing treatments that are around. So our goal is to expand the treatment options available to practitioners and their patients. And our focus at the moment is on psilocybin and MDMA, psilocybin for depression, MDMA for PTSD, because they're the most advanced in trials around the world. But we are also interested in other medicines like ayahuasca that Alberto mentioned, Ibogaine, DMT, and so on. But our goal is that these medicines become an integral part of our mental health system. So that if you go to the doctor, this will be one of the first line treatments that is offered to you with full disclosure on the risks and benefits of all treatments. So at the moment, we have a situation where a lot of patients go to the doctor, but doctors don't give full disclosure on the side effects, for example, of antidepressants. So we feel it's very important that there's an enormous transparency about all treatments and their benefits and their risks, and that these medicines do continue to achieve the high remission rates and they're accessible and affordable to all Australians, no matter where they're based and their financial circumstances. And we've put together an incredible advisory panel on ambassadors. This is just a snapshot of our ambassadors. You can see David there, of course, and, and these other gentlemen, many of whom are the founding fathers really of this new renaissance in psychedelic medicines. And most of these people have 
devoted their lives to making sure that these medicines and treatments can become available to treat people who are suffering and the suffering is getting worse. So as David mentioned, the remarkable thing about these treatments is they only require, well, he was talking about one treatment to get those incredible rates that he showed on his graphs. But in a lot of the trials, you know, just two to three doses are leading to complete remissions in combination with a short course of psychotherapy. And it is important to say, this is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So it's the medicine plus the psychotherapy that is leading to this curative effect that these medicines are getting. This is not just managing an illness or numbing a patient out with an antidepressant, it's actually leading to cures. And the medicines are very safe in medically controlled environments and they're non-addictive. Both of them have been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in the US, which is only granted to medicines that could be vastly superior to existing treatments to fast track the approval process. And in medically controlled environments, you can see some of the stages here that, that um, patients go through. So there's initial screening, getting to know the therapist, then the short uh, a number of dosing sessions, but the integration, which is fundamental because for many patients, they name these medicine sessions as one of the five most meaningful experiences in their lives because the sense of connection and unity and oneness is so profound. But to bring those insights back into life, into relationships, into work, take significant integration with experienced therapists, which is why we now have a therapist training program in Australia so that we can make sure that psychologists and GPs, and psychiatrists, physicians and nurses and social workers can be trained to work with patients in non-ordinary states. This is another study that David did, um, which shows the relative drug harm uh, drug harms um, of different drugs in recreational environments. And it's really fascinating there to see that even in recreational environments, psilocybin and MDMA are considered to be extremely safe by comparison to alcohol. And Alberto was just talking about alcohol before, which is, of course is the most dangerous drug by far uh, in, in terms of harm to self. You can see there in blue and harm to others in red. And here's some more wonderful testimonials to add to some of David's. You know, one week of intensive treatment provided transformational healing for a veteran there. And many veterans are experiencing incredible remissions. And you can see a patient there on the right hand side going through a treatment with an eye mask on. They've got headphones on or are listening to a beautiful curated playlist. And I do specialize in creating beautiful playlists for these ceremonies. But the second testimonial here as well everyone deserved to have this experience. Surely this is our human birthright to experience expanded consciousness, that wars would be impossible to wage. And this final one, I, went I felt like I went through 15 years of psychological therapy in one night. So not only are patients getting well and in many cases staying well, but actually the cost savings through these treatments can also be enormous. Now, I won't go through um, that one because David spoke about that wonderful fMRI representation. But in the recent MDMA phase two and phase three trials taking place in the US, you have the phase two trials with MDMA, which are showing like for 105 patients with PTSD for an average of 18 years, that 52% of those went into remission immediately after just three medicinal doses with psychotherapy and 68% at the 12 month follow up. And there's more and more research showing the incredible effect of MDMA for patients with trauma so that um, they actually don't get the re-triggering and the re-traumatizing that usually occurs when they're asked to talk about their trauma. So instead, what happens is MDMA decreases the activity of the amygdala, which is associated with traumatic memory. And as Alberto spoke about so powerfully about the fight and flight and how that can be calmed down so that a patient with trauma can actually talk safely with their therapist and be able to come to terms with their trauma and move forwards with their lives, which has led to the current phase three trials in the US, which are going extremely well in multi-sites and MDMA is expected to be prescribable in the next 18 months in the US and other countries will follow, including the Euro in Europe and, and Australia. So, Globally, what we're seeing is this incredible 
um, momentum. We're seeing um, new trials underway for a range of addictions. Uh, we're seeing new trials underway for dementia, for anorexia and eating disorder, Parkinson's, weight loss, cluster headaches. We're seeing expanded access schemes, compassionate schemes, providing access to patients who are treatment resistant to other treatments, Switzerland, Israel, the US, Canada, and even in Australia and in Australia. Our government has just announced $15 million of funding towards clinical trials to advance um, R&D in this space. And then of course, we're seeing decriminalization in numerous US states, Oregon, the first state to legalize psilocybin, the therapeutic use and other states are following and the Canadian government legalizing access to psilocybin assisted psychotherapy for end of life patients and also for some PTSD patients. Of course, again, all of these treatments take place in clinics uh, with trained therapists. Patients don't take the medicines home in, in these medical environments and the German government as well is investing heavily in this space. And these are just some of the universities around the world, Yale, Oxford, Harvard, Imperial College, you know, who are doing research and have advanced programs in this space. David's talked beautifully about um, the history, but Stan Groff there, one of the great psychiatrists who is still alive today, who was one of the founding fathers of these treatments as well, who said psychedelics would be for psychiatry, what the microscope is for biology and medicine, or the telescope is for astronomy. And of course, David spoke about this terrible censorship, um, the worst censorship of research and medical treatment because of banning these substances when they were banned in 1970, which created this last 50 years where we've seen this major spike in loneliness, social isolation, depression, and disconnection. And if these medicines had continued to be researched and used, who knows where the world would be now? No doubt, hopefully, we, I hope the planet wouldn't be in such a bad place. But where we are, we are, we are where we are. And now we just have to move forwards and try and make sure that these medicines become available to those who need them as soon as possible. And eventually uh, that they should become available to anyone who wants to work on expanding their consciousness. Uh, so this is just a snapshot of some of the trials taking place recently or, or um, taking place at the moment. And you can see there again, that we're now back just above where we were in 1970. We're also seeing a, an enormous growth in the for-profit space around the world with now probably every two weeks, a for-profit company starts around the world to investigate the molecules, look at clinical rollouts or manufacturing of the medicines. And that, that one, the first company there, Compass, um, when Peter and I started the charity two years ago, just over two years ago, there was just Compass, which is now worth nearly $2 billion Australian dollars, about 1.6 US dollars. But we have all these other companies and this is just some, there's many more that are starting up around the world. So our goal with Mind Medicine Australia has been to build the ecosystem in Australia through education events. We've set up chapters around Australia. We have the first major international medical summit in November in Australia. We've started the first professional development certificate in psychedelic assisted therapy that I mentioned. We're looking at setting up a center of excellence in psychedelic assisted therapies in Australia. And of course, we're looking at the preferred legal and ethical frameworks, talking to our regulators and making sure that these medicines become available. Tim Ferriss finally said, I view the next years as a golden, absolutely golden window in which we can all help to impact and help you know, heal the suffering of millions of people through donations and supporting this emerging field. You can help spread the word, talk about it, look at our learn section, attend events, and just make sure that we remove the stigma and prejudice around these medicines and focus on the data and the science. And this Thank is you, Tanya. Well. That's Thank awesome. You. <laughs> Thank you so much. And really interesting. We have a very short time for Q&A because maybe the use of, of all these psychedelics means that timing, time doesn't exist. So that's a wonderful thing. So I have some interesting questions for all four of you. So if you can, uh, all three of you, so if you can please uh, turn your cameras on and, and uh, there will be some questions. And, and one thing we've talked about alcohol, David, um, why is alcohol, I mean, we've understood it. Why is it such a powerfully bad and damaging drug? Well, it's toxic and addictive. 
Do you need to That's do anything That's two very anymore? good reasons. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, I have you there because I know that you have to run. So I think those toxic and addictive. And would you say that the psychedelics are not toxic and addictive in the same way? Yes, they're not toxic and they're not addictive. One of the biggest, it's amazing. Most people believe that psychedelics are addictive because they are controlled drugs. And, you know, and they're not. But that's, that's actually in some ways the biggest challenge we've got to get over even educated people, even you know people who you know know pharmacology, doctors, and that still believe they're addictive because why else would they be controlled if they weren't addicted? Oh well, yeah, the power of uh, various other powers that has other interest. I would say now you talked right. a lot about and everyone has talked about MDMA and LSD and DMT and psilocybin. Now, which one works the best? It depends so what you're using it for. <laughs> Depends on the condition, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I think you party better on MDMA, but you get more insights on uh, on LSD. That's what I would say. <laughs> I think that we need to really break away from this notion that we're treating conditions with these sacred plant medicines, because that's yeah. really the Western framework for research. That's so important. Clinical trials, yes, absolutely. But there's so much bigger movement happening popularly where these substances are used for creativity, for helping to facilitate this next stage in human growth, maybe in evolution. So yeah, and I was thinking there because is it so we've talked a lot about because that's what science have to do about curing depression, but is it so that you this is actually preventative so you don't even have to get depressed, so you actually should ha do it before you get depressed or if you just feel that you're getting into becoming a bit uh, lower. So is, is that something that would be a common use in the future, do you see? I'd quite like to see it doing that, yeah. I mean, it's difficult for me though as a doctor to kind of get beyond, I mean, I don't want to be outside my, I don't want to be talking about things I don't know much about, but uh, it seems to me that the, uh, the I, Tanya made a very good point. You can't solve the mental health problem by quadrupling the number of doctors and psychiatrists and mental health nurses. You've got to approach it differently. It's a, you know, we're failing with the current approach and we need to provide resilience in young people. And psychedelics may be a great way of doing that. Mm, and like vision quests, like Alberto with, um, you know, if only vision quests were part of, you know, every young person's development, you know, we have bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs and things like that, but wouldn't it be wonderful if, you know, the rites of passage that you talk about so much in your work could be part of every child's development. And imagine how that would reverse the mental health statistics and the lack of connection that we are experiencing. I think another important point for me is that today we have every reason to be depressed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, the, the, it's, the, the news is so, the, so how do, how do we, deal with a bigger problem that uh, that the shamans were always attending to not only to treat disease but to facilitate the um the, the development of a village or a community to adapt to changing times yeah, yeah. no absolutely so i have a question here from guy guy Moore. it's been said that psychiatry is the only area of medicine going backwards do you think that is because of the way we're living today because psychiatry has the modern wrong or both. And what he says when he clarifies is going backwards means in terms of we're getting more depression diagnosis, longer depression incidents and population that we would otherwise expect to be healthy. Yeah, it's a complicated question. I mean, there's several th threads to that. The first is it, that medicine is moving ahead faster. So in a sense, um, we're being left behind because we, you know, we understand quite a lot about most of the other organs of the body, but we really don't really understand the brain. So we, that's the first thing. The second thing is that the technological approaches, the molecular approaches, atomistic approaches that Alberto mentioned, which actually do stem back to the ancient Greeks. So I'm going to blame the ancient Greeks. It may be that um, Ergot gave them the vision of the future, but it might have given them the slightly, the, a rather... Yeah, it gave them perhaps one as opposed to the alternative vision. And I'm very much with you there, Alberto. But that to the, the atomistic uh, version, which of course is underpinning al almost all you know, uh, medical research at present, is not 
going to work in the brain. And, and the big challenge I have now and uh, as a psychiatrist is persuading my colleagues who have, you know, just about got to understand that the brain is got, has got things like transmitters and receptors and to understand that those actually on the future, the future is integration of brain function rather than atomization of it. And that is a huge problem when it comes to funders and it, and it comes to um, investors and, it, and, and companies that want to get in this field because the, the, the pharmaceutical development model is just not, the current one for the rest of the body isn't fit for the brain. And, but people haven't worked that out yet. And, and we're still, so yeah, so I got, in 2012, I got funding to do that first trial of depression from the Medical Research Council in Britain and they have turned down five subsequent grants. I have not got a single grant from it, despite having, you know, set up this world break, world, you know, beating trial, because they want trials to be based on conventional medicine, not on what psychedelic medicine is. So that is that, to my mind, is a huge problem. So psychiatry is behind because we um, we. The model has changed, and 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 we don't want to keep up with that model. We want to develop our own model, which is what you're doing. Yeah, it's it's a hard, difficult thing there with big pharma wanting to make money sometimes. But so, uh, just a question that passes here because Leanna asked, "What is SAS B?" Oh, people okay. Yeah, so it's, that's an expanded access pathway that we have in Australia, um, which is provided to doctors and psychiatrists uh, for patients who are treatment resistant to two, two or three or more treatments. So a lot of different things have been tried and we get letters um, and messages from patients every day and devastating where they've been, they've tried maybe 15 or more um, antidepressants and antipsychotics. They've, some of them might've had 75 or hundred ECT shock, you know, therapy treatments, EMDR, cognitive behavioral therapies, every type of, treatment you can imagine and in fact many of them are just getting worse and they're many of them are suicidal so the Australian government is granting approvals to um, doctors who have patients in that sort of category to be treated with psilocybin or MDMA assisted therapy and there are similar access expanded access schemes in other countries around the world like Switzerland Israel um, US so on as well Brilliant. but it's, 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 it's a slow way it's a way that some patients can be treated, but it's not a, it's not a way of treating, you know, the millions of people who are suffering, but it's a start. It's a trickle. <laughs> there has been any, does anyone you know of you if there's been research done with psychedelics that does not involve the brain, but other like the whole body? Well, yes, I can tell you quite a bit about that. I mean, so there are trials going underway at present to use low dose LSD for asthma. There's a trial being set up to use low dose non psychedelic DMT for stroke to see the neuroplasticity can help stroke. Um, there are trials for using non psychedelic drugs like um, was it five um, five Bremo LSD BOL for uh, the cluster headaches, severe pain syndromes, uh, and I think there's a lot of interest in, in anti inflammatory effects of psychedelics too. But mm. those might almost certainly come in at low non-psychedelic doses so whether that's actually a psychedelic effect or just a pharmacological effect is a bit unclear but i mean alberto probably has some insights into that as well you can't really dissociate the immune system and the brain are interrelated yeah but you know the it's unfortunate that the brain is the only organ that you cannot study directly you have to basically kill your subject yes. to be able yes. to and then it then it turns into the consistency of a milkshake in about 12 hours so uh, in, it's fascinating, a lot of science behind the uh, use of psilocybin, for example, to treat migraines that are so difficult to treat. Yeah. One session, migraines gone, but it's still not being translated into a clinical practice. It's not being adopted. The adoption, I think, by the yeah. system yeah. that that's ruled by big pharma, and, I, and we're in the age of pharmageddon today, I'm, I'm convinced. <laughs> Is not able to to integrate these um, these amazing therapies that are proven. It's it's interesting. To, so Alberta, how do we safeguard also? Because we're talking of this uh, of this sacred medicine in a very clinical way, but how do we safeguard 
that it doesn't become scientific and too boxed in, but it's also a part of, of understanding the spirituality, Mother Earth, and a much greater part than just treating a certain boxed in diagnosis, because it's greater <laughs> than what we've spoken about. How do we get that discussion as well elevated? Well, that's what we're doing today. And that's what's really clever about it. And that's, that's why I'm here today, by the way, <laughs> because mostly I talk to scientists, but now you're doing your broadening. And that's, that's yeah. exactly right. And the point is, it's not one or the other. It is both. And that's why it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. But you're right. It's people like you, they're going to promote the other. People like me can do a pretty, pretty reasonable jog amongst doctors and scientists. But, but the broader ramifications, it needs people like you and, and Tanya and Alberta. And that's why it is very exciting, you know, that Six Senses is having this conversation because mm -hmm. you, know, you have a global reach that, you know, can really give a lot of the general population this sort of knowledge and awareness and so that people are not afraid or don't, you know, keep being um, attached to the stigma and prejudice that is attached to these treatments, which is so sad because they never deserve this. These medicines do not deserve what is happen to them and certainly we as human society desperately need access to these sorts of medicines now. You know, many so years I have ago a question. I was in Vienna. Go, go uh, I'm sorry. sorry. Just a small story. I, <clears throat> I was in the Amazon many years ago and I then I had had a I cut my leg and and it started getting infected. And I said to the shaman that I was working with and studying, I said, oh, I, you know, I've got an infection here. I've got these microscopic and, you know, these invisible organisms that are, that are trying to eat me and populate me. And they said, oh, you mean invisible organ like spirits? And I said, no, 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 these are bacteria. These are parasites. <laughs> they said, no, that stuff doesn't exist. Next time I went back, I took a little, little microscope with me and put a drop of water under the microscope. And I said, look at this, this, this is the invisible to you, but look at how much life and how many bacteria and creatures are in this drop of water. And they couldn't believe it. They had to go get their own drop of water to do their own science. And then they found that it was equally as full of life. And I have the same difficulty with this, with this, the people that take science as a religion today convincing them that there's an invisible world that you get exposed to when you take these plant medicines. And that is so shattering to the Western paradigm that says that the only reality is the material reality that we can see and measure. And here's where we have a great, um, a, a great divide that, that I think is bridged very rapidly the minute you take 25 micrograms of, uh, of psilocybin. <laughs> <laughs> it's milligrams, Alberta. It's milligrams. 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 <laughs> I was thinking I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, otherwise I can't get far. Um, but no, so uh, looking at this, and we have a question, and I'm not sure anyone can answer it because obviously it's a bit unconventional, but is there, do you have to have supervised uh ceremonies with the with the very psychedelics or is it as useful to do on your own well david you want to answer that one or well i mean the view i as a psych yeah you know, we're teaching people who are actually often very very ill and doing it on your own is not oh, likely to be as good as doing it with therapists but I, yeah. you know, I think the, the, the issue is whether you're you know we're talking about a medical case or whether they're talking about sort of resilience, personal growth, et cetera, they're very different. So medically, better, it's definitely safer to have a, have, a, have a therapist with you and probably better too. Yeah, and that's the appropriate thing to say for everyone. And I think it's a, it's a, a very difficult question to actually answer. So I, we're just going up to time and I, I really want to thank you. This has been elevated and for all the books and clarity with Six Senses as well, this is something that we, have facilitate the discussion, but of course, for everyone listening, that is important to follow all the rules, laws, and restrictions that is in every country. We are looking at seeing various ways of how we can facilitate a discussion on psychedelics to be used in a very appropriate and mindful way. But I think the main thing in the discussion today is also to look at, at the use of psychedelics, not only 
as a uh, treatment, but also it's about Mother Earth and spirituality and increased consciousness. And I think one of the best side effects you can you have of this, if there's such a side effect, is increase of love, empathy, affection, and compassion. That is not only, and I think that's why it helps depression to, but also to ourselves that we simply become more loving and compassionate to ourselves because i think we are ourselves biggest enemies often um so anyone wants to say a, a couple of last words before we end of wisdom yeah can i just i just want to show you this slide because just to feature just to sort of emphasize what alberto and tanya were saying what you just said so we can actually research this so after the in the first cycle psilocybin depression trial, we found that connectedness, particularly to nature and to spiritual principles went up. And I just love this quote, before I enjoyed nature, now I feel part of it. Before I was looking at it as a thing like TV or a painting, you're part of it. There's no separation or distinction, you are it. And I think putting us back into nature uh, is gotta be one of the great things that psychedelics do. That is so true, that is beautiful. Um, anyone else want to say some last words? Um, I, I just sorry. I want to thank David and Tanya for the beautiful work you're doing to encourage you and thank just deep gratitude for the opening these doors for all of us. Well, you were there first, Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. You're in the jungle a little bit. I... <laughs> yeah, we just had, we just had, you know, we just have different type, different tools. But yeah. and you're you're asking, you are laying the questions out for us. We're beginning to edge in that direction and to answers, I think. Well, yeah, no. thank you all so much. This has been a beautiful discussion. It is crucially important, and thank you for leading the trail and facilitating and doing the research. The uh, that you all are doing in your own way and spreading the knowledge. So I just want to wish you an incredibly glorious rest of the day. And thank you for participating in this masterclass and everyone who's been listening and everyone who will has not been listening, but will listen to it afterwards. You will be sent the recording, some material and wow. everything else that you need to know. So lovely to have you everyone here and uh, wishing you a blessed and lovely day. So thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks, Anna. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Bye-bye.